Podcast. I'm Kat. And I'm Moose. This is our interview series where we interview people who display the quirks of being human. Hey, Moose. Hey, Kat. I am so excited about who we have today as our guest. So, this woman is a mom. This woman is a speaker. This woman is a musician. This woman is beautifully displaying what it's like for life to transform and spirituality to grow. This woman is drop dead knockout gorgeous. This woman has sat with presidents before. This woman has the Cat and Moose podcast listed on her website. <laughs> we are going to enjoy our conversation from author, speaker, social media. Media, uh, influencer Juliana Zobrist. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you. My goodness, that was a very elaborate introduction and one I feel like I'm not very deserving of. But thank you so much. I'm really honored to be here. Really honored to be with you both. Well, thank you. We are so happy to have you. We were talking earlier about how we have to wear bright colors because like you are Miss Fashion. And so I started by, I brought a couple of things I wanted to show you guys. Yes, please. <laughs> this one we'll have to show our patrons is, uh, it's a honor to Jesus's birthday and it's bright green. <laughs> <laughs> uh, is Jesus wearing a pizza hat for his birthday? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. He has a pizza hat. And then I had this on, but I got too damn hot while I was sitting here and I looked like a giant piece of, of popcorn. But uh, I tried to wear my bright colors and uh, and own my space like you uh, preach so much. Oh, I love it so much. Yes, I, I do look like I got dressed in a massive Crayola box. So <laughs> you ever see a really tall four year old walking around Nashville or Chicago? <laughs> That's incredible. So I want to dive into, you know, kind of this evolution that you've been on. And I want to hear in your own words, you know, I feel like. You display truly being your truest self. And um, I feel like you have gathered this group of people, tons of them as an influencer. Um, but the ones that I recognize are kind of the Christians who are the curious Christians, right? The ones that have been like beat down by the religion side of things. And, you know, I feel like they are they are welcoming you. And I just want to open you know, the mic right now and just allow you to share what has that journey been like for you and as much as you want to share about it. Oh, thank you. Well, you're so right. I love my community so much. And it really is like a, a very wide range of people on the spiritual spectrum, I would call them, or even on the Christian spectrum to be more specific, um, because I come from a very, very conservative evangelical background. And I was a Christian pop singer for six years, you know, and I love the church and speak in the church. And it was like simultaneously as I'm loving and speaking in the church, all of these things are happening in, internally to me. And it would be like, okay, I have three children, so I'm going to use a, a, a pregnancy metaphor, but it would be like, <laughs> you go to the hospital and the doctor's like, oh, you're in labor. And you're like, oh my God, I'm pregnant. What? You know, I don't even know if I'm gonna have a baby. Like what the hell? You know, that's how my spiritual kind of transformation happened. It just sort of happened to me, and all of a sudden, I'm like, you know, there's no epidural that's gonna help this. Like <laughs> this is nutty. So five years ago, for me, my third, my second daughter, my third child was born, and I was getting ready to go on tour, and I was like very out of shape and I just released my record and we have a four month tour in two months. And I'm like sitting there with my infant in this like glazed donut midsection that I have happening. And, <laughs> and I'm like, what am I doing? What am I doing? I don't need to be working. Like, why am I, why do I feel so called to use my voice? You know, mm -hmm. can't I just like sit back and ride this life and yeah. <laughs> have to work hard? And I, so I went to what my normal MO would be, which was these female Christian books and I'm reading them and it's like, you know, being a wife and being a mom and being a disciple and reading the Bible and going to church every Sunday. And it literally was like 
a pin drop moment in my life where I look at my infant daughter and I thought, according to these books, either my daughters have no purpose yet, or these books are kind of bullshit. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Concerns like femininity and a woman's role in the church. And honestly, that was the moment for me where like everything began to dismantle in terms of how I thought of God, how I thought of like being a submissive wife. What does that even mean? Like, why are we, you know? Yeah. And, um, and then I got asked to write my first book, pull it off. And I made the really, really terrible decision. A lot of people would say to start reading. I picked up a goddamn book and I started to read. <laughs> and you guys, it was like l literally reading became the totem pole of my liberation. Yeah. I could not stop reading. I could not stop. And it was everything from Plato. And then I got Plato tattooed on my arm. And then it was <laughs> Margaret Fuller and Walt Whitman and Ralph Waldo Emerson. Mm -hmm. And I mean, just all of these amazing writers that have gone before me that are saying things like, honor your becoming. Don't, mm -hmm. don't temper who you are. Don't adjust who you are. Don't be quiet any longer. Like, this isn't this isn't the best for you. This is actually just a, a very steeped in religion, patriarchal system that you've been mm -hmm. living within and right. your curiosity and your divinity. I believe God, like within me was the one that was going, you know, it is time. Like yes. it is time for you to really use your voice, to become truly liberated, to no longer confine and limit my mind. And um, I mean, the rest is history, you know? <laughs> Well, and the rest is happening right in front of us. You know, it's like, like every single, every single post you make, every single step you take is, is just like a, a beautiful snapshot into your journey continuing to evolve. And I think that's part of why we wanted to talk to you because we've been watching you and watching your story and going, man, me too. You know, like not the same things. Like I, I want to clarify for everyone in case our audience isn't sure. I am not a fashion model and I do not wear cool clothes clothes. So, so, so Jules, cause we're friends now, Jules and I, we have a lot in common, not everything in common, but at least that, um, it is that we're on an exploration, we're on a journey and it's evolving and it's growing. And I know Moose said, um, in our most recent podcast episode, she said something along the lines of, if I have the same attitude and mentality when I'm 70 years old that I do today, something is wrong. Yeah. Oh, isn't that the truth? But it's terrifying. And it's yeah. not the easier, it's not the easier way. You know, mm -hmm. the easier way is to stay within our confines of tradition or culture or expectation of family and upbringing and even, um, you know, even ethnic like dynamics, yes. you know, it's the easier thing to stay in our shallow end. And it's the harder mm -hmm. thing to, as Walt Whitman says, which this is like my life quote, he said, question everything. Yes. Question everything and dismiss whatever insults your own soul. And that is, that is a dangerous path to walk of, of liberation because it costs so much. Yeah. Yes. Like for me, you can't ask the people around you to grow with you. You mm -hmm. can't ask family, yes. friends, spouses, partners, you know, um, siblings to grow alongside you and to reconsider theologies along with you. Um, mm -hmm. can't force that on people. It's their own journey. Yeah, it, it definitely is. And, um, one thing that I was reading about you, you have a book club and it's called read with jewels. Tell us about that. Oh my goodness. I love our book club so, so much. Um, it is, it, it honestly is just a platform on Facebook right now. And it's a space where over 318 of us gather together and read books together. And I have to be honest, like it definitely is a peak and a window into my own current transformation. You know, mm -hmm. I'm not, I'm not stepping onto a hypothetical stage um, yeah. to teach you necessarily. I'm mm -hmm. along with you because mm -hmm. I think a mistake that we make is that we wait so long to say, Hey, I'm in the midst of this massive call it what you must, what you will, like spiritual <laughs> crisis or life transformation or whatever it is. And you're stumbling and finding your footing. And a, a mistake that we make is that we wait. We yes. wait so long 
to come out and say, oh, hindsight 2020, this is what I just went through. Good luck. You know, mm-hmm. because it doesn't feel like there's really anyone to walk through these types of moments with us, especially as a woman. At least yes. I didn't, I felt like I didn't have that. So it's such an honor for me to gather these. It, it's been all women so far <laughs> together to just sit in the space of the waiting, like sit in the liminal space of not knowing, honor our curiosity, honor the mystery that is God and God and culture and growing and advocacy and all of these things that we're all learning together. So, um, yeah, it's such an honor to be a part of that. I am freaking out over here. Cause I have like 45 things that you've said that I want to touch on. <laughs> um, you just said liminal space and it's one of my favorite phrases. I actually learned it from Rob Bell. Oh. He did like a whole podcast episode on liminal space. And I think we even talked about it last year, Kat on the podcast, uh-huh. but, um, you know, it, it um, I, I'm, I'm fascinated with it because it's the space in between, right? It's the space where creativity can happen from when this ends and this begins. And, um, you know, something you said just a second ago is, you know, kind of being with people and not the expert, which is something we talk about on the podcast all the time. We, we really want to embrace everyone around us that's in our community and say like, look, we, this is our experience. This doesn't have to be your experience but at least be open enough to have the conversation with us. And I, I, I saw that you guys did um, the searching for Sunday book by Rachel Held Evans. Are you still doing that book? No, we're done with that book and oh my goodness. Done a couple more since then, but um, we're gearing up for second quarter because we have uh, some exciting new things coming. So awesome. it's getting bigger, it's getting bigger and it's a lot to manage. So we're, <laughs> we're coming up with some fun plans. Wonderful. Well, I wanted to mention a quote from that Rachel Held Evans book, because I feel like you being an influencer, I think that that word can be so tainted, I think, in some ways. But I feel like you have taken it to a place where you're basically just welcoming people in. And there's a quote from that Searching for Sunday book that says, imagine if every church became a place where everyone is safe, but no one is comfortable. Imagine if every church became a place where we told one another the truth we might just create sanctuary. And I I Mm. think, and I I know that feels very big, but I just want to say like in your small group and in those 300 some women, like you're creating that. And Mm. I, we know what it takes to step out and use your voice. Like we're in, we're in a similar boat as you, we both work in the Christian music industry. We, you know, a year ago, we looked at each other and said, we have to have these conversations with other people, people that are, aren't, aren't brave enough to maybe raise their hand and say like, I'm questioning these things too. So you're, it's just such an honor to have you here. And I just want to, I want to say that again, because, um, uh, I, I just, I feel like we're on the same path in a lot of ways. Thank you for saying that. And I couldn't agree more that it does feel like a sanctuary, you know, yes. even, even this, like, this is my type of church, you know, yeah. mm-hmm. where you can show up as is, And you can even show up with the hidden parts of yourself. And that's what I think Mm -hmm. is so gorgeous about grace, which I can truly tell you that as difficult as my life has been over the last two years, I have tasted the pure, like undiluted flavor of grace for the Mm -hmm. first time in my entire life, because it is this pervasive stepping toward this, Mm -hmm. this incessant open shore it's like a runway for a life. That's what grace is. It's like, give me all you got. Give me everything you can. I'm here to receive you. I think about um, Plutarch's The Ship of Theseus. Mm-hmm. It was one of the um, writings that just really revolutionized the way that I think as a mother, but then also as somebody in in the world, you know, um, in whatever compa- capacity is that like when a ship goes out, my job is never to fix the ship as it's out. My job is to welcome it back into its harbor. Mm, and I wow. feel like that is what sanctuary is. That is what grace is, is this um, incessant coming toward this limitless shoreline, this safe harbor that's saying you are home. You are home, irregardless of what you're bringing back in mm. and how you've changed your ship since being out on your journey. Like you are home here. And, and that is grace to me. 
Juliana, that was really beautiful. Thank you so much for sharing that. And, and as an encouragement to you, um, as, as watching your journey from the perspective that we've been able to, like, I've thought even in reading some of your quotes and some of the things that you've said, like, I have felt like this is a safe Harbor person. Like I have felt like this is someone who it's like, I, I'm not going to be judged by and who does understand that they need grace just as much as I do. And, and something that you wrote that I think kind of, kind of falls in line with that, that I want to ask you about is you asked a question, you said, how will we begin to eradicate inequality in our world? We're all equal because we're created in the image of God. Can you say more about that, about how it's like, how, how can we possibly eradicate inequality in the world if we don't first recognize that, that we are equal? Can you say more about that? Oh my goodness. Well, this is like my heart and soul right now is people ask me all the time, what do you believe? And I'm like, I don't know a lot of what I believe right now, but the one truth that I do believe and in fullness is Imago Dei, the belief that we've all been created in the image of God. Um, Every single race, gender, um, ethnicity, you know, ability, sexual orientation, like every single one of us, we're like, if God is a puzzle, he's, he or she has fractioned God's self out into us. So, you know, Kat, you are carrying an image and an imprint of God that I don't carry. And what's so gorgeous about that is that you and I no longer have to be in competition because it's not about who's better or worse or more wrong or more holy or less than or needs to be held more accountable or needs to do more study. Like it's not about that anymore. It's about you carrying and owning and speaking forth the truth that is the imprint of God upon your life and the same for you, Moose, and the same for myself. And so what it does is it obliterates this need for spiritual hierarchy, which is the context that I am used to, and that I have come out of since then <laughs> is, um, you know, when, uh, when theologies and the reason that I wrote it on top of everything that's going on in our nation with black lives matter movement and just the pervasiveness of white supremacy and the, my own journey and realizing how I've played a part in my mm-hmm. own ignorance and my own work toward now becoming an anti-racist and being resilient and vocal about that. Um, what I see coming from my context is that when, when theologies are rooted in oppressiveness, Mm -hmm. there are oppressive theologies, then not only are we oppressing one another just for the sake of oppression, but we're oppressing one another and justifying it upon the Bible and justifying our hatred Mm -hmm. upon scripture. And Mm -hmm. so in that way, the Bible has been twisted and manipulated and turned into this weapon instead of it being this great equalizer of equality. That is incredible. (laughs) I mean, okay, Moose, like, you know how we, how we did that Enneagram series a while back and we talked about how, like, I, I am just like, I feel like a magnet sometimes for like people who are really, really, really intelligent. Mm -hmm. Like I'm kind of glad that Jules and I are not in the same room right now because I might tackle her and give her the (laughs) biggest hug in the world because you're so articulate um, and so intelligent, so well read. It's really a delight to to just listen to you talk about this stuff. And it makes me kind of wonder, do you happen to know your Enneagram type? I'm an eight. Yeah! <laughs> okay, we had this debate because I, uh, Sarah, producer Sarah said she's either a seven with an eight wing or just an eight, just straight up an eight. And I'm an eight as well. Yes. Um, and I said, I don't know. I see a lot of four in her with all of her fashion stuff and all these different things. And <laughs> Kat, you thought she was an eight too, right? Uh, well, I wasn't sure. I thought she was a seven because I don't know how you can do all of the things you've done with the amount of enthusiasm and authenticity and energy that you have and not have some bit of seven in you because every seven I know seems like this 
endless well of energy. And I'm like, oh my God, she wrote a book and she did a record and she's a mom and all these things. And I'm like, how in the world does she not have some seven in her? So that makes total sense, Jules, that you're an eight. And I've got to say, you've got a really healthy seven wing. I do. I do. I'm yeah. an eight wing seven. So you nailed me. You That's so good. I'm also an eight wing seven. Do you, do you have to like shut down after you use all of your energy? Do you go to your five and just, I mean, the fact that you read a ton suggests maybe you do. Um, well, that is a, that is a brilliant question. And I'm, I'm a little embarrassed to say, I don't know what the five means. <laughs> <laughs> it, uh, five is just about myself. <laughs> <laughs> let's just stick. Let's just stick with you. Like eights, we 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 often go to this place where after we emote and we're really vibrant and funny and all the things that we can do, we often have to kind of shut down and turn our minds off, and we need a lot of quiet. I have found with other eights, so I didn't know if that might be the case for you. Yeah, absolutely. Um, my source of inspiration and reprieve and like feeling of regrowth happens in books and in nature. Mm. So those are the two things that I'm most grateful for. And that offer me more just fuel to my life than anything else. Really. That's so awesome. And I, and I love like nature is, is such a great respite for, I mean, obviously for all of us, for so many reasons, Moose and I went on a, a nature therapy thing and it was really, really cool. And then last week we talked about the Fibonacci spiral that you find in nature and like snail shells and pine cones and things like that. So it makes sense to me that, that we all find, but especially those of you who, who have a part of you that goes toward that five on the Enneagram um, uh, of the, the beauty and the intricacy and the peace in nature. It makes a lot of sense. Yes, absolutely. That was, I mean, from the time that I was a child, the place that I felt the most solace and yet still the, the most connectedness to God was in nature. Mm -hmm. I was the girl that like took her journal and her book and her pen out into the backyard and found this tree that looked like a seat and sat on the chair, you know, my, my nature chair yeah. Until my mom would literally ring the bell for dinner, you know, <laughs> that's so cool. Yeah. So cool. Isn't it amazing how we look back at that and we go like, oh, everything that we need is right here. We just we have to reconnect with that little girl mm. and go like that fed her soul. You know, like I can go back to that and enjoy that same experience. Yes, absolutely. I, I think truly the interconnectedness of ourselves with nature with the divine is just it's ubiquitous you just yes. have to have the eyes to see it yes <laughs> um i want to talk about something that you wrote i'm basically going to read everything you wrote on here so that we can comment about it but um <laughs> that this really sparked something um with me and i want to share it um you said this on instagram i love the largeness in you i love your cyclone power those who are threatened, embarrassed, uncomfortable by your largeness will want you to be smaller, but they will just need to go ahead and find a smaller space elsewhere. Not with you, love. No hard feelings. Just move along. Do not shrink. Do not cower. Do not drown your power. And like, holy crap. Like I, I read this and I was like, this resonates with me so much. I feel like being an eight my whole life. You know, I've been to told to like tone down who I am or, you know, um, just been told like that's enough or, you know, you're being really intense right now, you know, and like that's that's who I've always been. Like I, I, I um, in fact, like I want to get back to that magic, you know, like I I've spent, you know, probably the past 20 years, like many of us do, you know, swallowing myself in shame and things that, you know, I, I need to shed now. And so I'm just curious, like you, you feel, you know, um, on Instagram, at least as someone who feels pretty fearless. Um, and I'm just curious, like for you, how did you take back that power? Oh, that's such a good question. <laughs> well, I have to be very honest and say, I mean, for an eight, what is our greatest fear is being destroyed. Oh, yeah. Being, yep. I went through a period of extreme exposure and public humiliation and death threats and the whole nine yards for about a year. 
And some of that still lives on, although it's lessened. But um, my greatest fear is of, is of that like destruction. And so there was a period of time for myself where I literally, I felt like I had been deboned. Hmm. I had to just, I, I went off Instagram for almost an entire year. Wow. And that time was just growing my bones and reading to myself roomy poetry and reminding myself yes. of, of who I am and that, you know, people are threatened when you make decisions for your life that they would not have made or they're threatened when they see a woman living her life in her fullness and right. they don't have the courage to do that. And so rather than having the bravery to look at themselves, it's just easier to tear her down, you know? So regaining my power took a lot of solitude for me mm. for a long time, for a long time. I needed solitude to regain my bones. I was reading and journaling and writing and going to an insane amount of therapy <laughs> yeah. and um, EMDR, extremely healing and um, really just caring for myself, my person started eating regularly, which is like, you know, a novelty. <laughs> Who knew that that was a thing? You know. <laughs> hey, I can teach you about that if you need a coach. <laughs> I, <laughs> um, but then, you know, when I came back out onto Instagram, I knew that I was coming out not having figured everything out. I knew that I was coming out um, wanting to say, this is who I am and this is what I believe and this is what I stand for. And I want to, I want to show you this. You know, I want to no longer be held back by oppressive theologies. Um, and there was a there was a white male in my community that said, "Lady, you have just gone completely off the rails. You got to stop reading those psychology and philosophy books and get your head back in the Word of God. You've, go, you've gone completely off the rails." <laughs> and I thought, you know, at the time previously, that probably would have crushed my soul. Yeah. That all I wanted was to be the good Christian girl. Mm -hmm. no. But now I'm looking at a white man who's so threatened by my largeness, who's yep. so threatened by, by my ability to stand up and say, no, the, you know, what you're demanding of women and justifying it based upon the Bible and all of the, you know, the guys 400 years ago that burnt all the scriptures about the women, like your oppressive theologies are no longer have power over me. Your shame no longer has power over me. And I just simply said, hell yeah, I've gone off the rails. I've gone off the rails of racism, sexism, homophobia, xenophobia, um, you know, the patriarchy, all of these things. Yes, I've yes. gone completely off the rails. And you know what? I think that that's exactly what Christian women need to do. Come, Come on. on. Come on. What do you do? It's time we start going off the rails and it's time we start looking back at the scriptures themselves and seeing the women that have done that before us. Mm -hmm. That's right. Queen Vashti's of the Bible. I mean, goodness, even Jesus's own mother. Yep. Who was pregnant and outcast by her family. And, you know, her husband was like going to divorce her quietly because <laughs> of her impurity or whatever. Like these women are are scandalous and the Mary Magdalene's and and the Rahabs and all of these women who were who were completely countercultural and subversive in their own right who knew the love of God so deeply and who believed it and then I mean obviously history itself it repeats itself it's like the Joan of Arcs the Margaret Fullers the Jane Goodall who was given only six yes. months time because she was a woman. And so we'll just see how she does, you know, and then, <laughs> and then no at all, you know, <laughs> this is not new. This right. is not new. And this is what Christian women need is to start going off the road. I'm so inspired by you, Jules. I, you mentioned Mary Magdalene a second ago, and it made me think of something I read that you wrote the other day about. Um, and I'd love if you can remember some of it, cause I'm probably not going to articulate it properly, but you basically said like, what if she silenced her voice because of fear? Like, what if she disbelieved her own eyes? Like, can you talk about what you wrote? Yeah. Well, Mary Magdalene, I mean, there's so much that's been written about her and so much that I believe has been very misconstrued about her, but she was a dear friend of Christ. Mm -hmm. And for whatever reason, he chose to reveal himself to her. And like, it was very scandalous for a woman to be close to a man, mm -hmm. much less a man like Jesus. 
Mm-hmm. I mean, it wasn't normal, you know? It wasn't normal for her to sit at his feet. It wasn't normal for her to really be like a rabbinical pup, like sitting there like, <laughs> teach me, you know, that wasn't normal for her yeah. to be um, even intellectual in that way. That was not normal or accepted. And I just think about, I think about two things. I think about how I would have thought about her then, mm. like the jewels five years ago, the jewels whose friend called her, me, my friend called me and said, I'm getting a divorce. And I totally shamed her, mm-hmm. completely shamed her like called her to repentance, you know, in my little self-righteous way. I didn't, I didn't know any better. So I think about myself now, who would I have been to Mary Magdalene then? Mm -hmm. Like gorgeous, loves Jesus, super close to him, like wants to learn, is the first one that he's talked to. Like, would I be a friend to her? Would Mm -hmm. I be a champion of her? Mm -hmm. Or would I be the woman on the sidelines tearing her down? Would I be the woman who's like, yeah, pick up the stone because that's what the Bible says. The Bible says to pick up the stone, you know, what yeah. we and probably right now, how we treat one another, how we treat these, these thinkers of our time right now is how we would have treated her then. And then my second thought is just sort of the obvious one, like, and I, I'm not a scholar in biblical theology at all. So there are people that could probably speak to this better, but just, if she hadn't trusted her knowing, you know, yes, she hadn't trusted what she knew about her Jesus, mm-hmm. what she knew about their relationship, what she knew about his love for her, mm. then she probably would have shut up. Like she probably would not, not have felt, felt so empowered to carry this yeah. message forth. Yeah. She maybe would have just been like, oh, that was great. I mean, I probably did not see what I just thought I saw, you know, and then for him to instruct her to go and tell the men. Like if she had listened to the cultural standard of the time, she would have been completely forbidden from doing so. Mm. And we wouldn't have this story. We wouldn't Mm. have really like a a matriarch of feminism. Right. If it were not for her bravery at the time. What do you say to, and and, you know, I recognize you're, you're not, like you said, you're not a biblical scholar. Um, We've all received our own criticism as we've each walked through the deconstruction or the emergence of, you know, whatever is new. And what do you say to people who are like, well, it's in the Bible. So there's that, which by the way, on our last episode, I sort of challenged that. And I said, that's not good enough anymore. And, you know, Kat and I actually went back and forth of like, you know, Kat was like, wait, were you saying that the Bible is not, you know, and and we had our own sort of exchange of like, are, are we, did you really mean to say that? And I said, I absolutely did. Like, I I feel like so much of my own spirituality is my relationship with the divine, like you said, you know, and that is the male divine, the female divine, you know, it's, it's my friendship with Jesus and all this nerdy stuff that before I would have laughed at myself saying, and now I believe it more than ever. And so I'm just curious, like, what do you, what would you say to someone who's like, well, in the Bible, it says this, this, and this, because I see a lot of criticism of you and everyone else <laughs> who's on the same path saying like, you're, you've gone astray, you've gone astray from the Bible. Right. Yeah. I mean, first of all, I understand. I understand because that was me. 100% yeah. that was me. And so there's, there's definitely an element of compassion there. And I don't mean that in any kind of condescending way. I mean, true compassion. Sure. That for me, I didn't, I couldn't know what I didn't know, you know, but then once I knew it, I couldn't unsee it, you know? Yeah. And so I recognize that everyone is on their own spiritual path and that is not my job to correct, nor do I truly have any desire to Yeah. In debates like that. Um, but additionally, you know, there are different ways of interpreting the Bible. And I, I mean, nobody's going to come calling for me to be a professor of theology anytime <laughs> soon. But for me, what I would say is like, there's a way that we can read scripture in order to define love. Like, what does scripture say about love? You know, the way that I view scripture is I think of love to interpret the scripture. Oh, wow. The interpretation of scripture comes from a place of love. 
I'm not looking to the scripture to help define that for me. Hmm. I believe for myself that that is, that's something that's um, completely inerrant to me, has been given to me and um, is mine alone. So I, I do hold tightly to what Whitman said that I will question everything Mm. and I will dismiss what I think is out of alignment with love. Mm -hmm. You talk about that knowing in your gut, especially as an eight, like we we're known for like, but it feels wrong or it, you know, like you can, you feel, we feel things very intensely. And, um, I can't agree with you more. Like I, I think so much of what is labeled deconstruction, um, of our faith is us checking in with the God that is inside of us. That's running through our blood. You know, uh, I forget who said it, but they taught, um, there's a, it's a poet poetry excerpt that is, um, a phrase is, um, you know, I want to chase God. Like, like my head is on fi- like someone with their head on fire. Who's trying to dip it in water. Like I, I need yeah. to be able to chase it. And it's interesting. Cause I didn't really, have this passion for Christianity, even though I sort of fell into it, uh, until I started going, is it possible that women are allowed to have a freaking voice, you know, and, (laughs) and just having these, like you said, these questions, like, you know, Rilke also talks about like living in the questions and, um, and it really hasn't been until the past few years that I feel like I, after reading Richard Rohr and all the things, you know, like you start going like, Oh my God. Like you said, like I'm pregnant. (laughs) Holy shit. I don't even remember having sex. And there is something inside of me that is alive and about to come out of me. Whoa, Moose. (laughs) It's like, what will the kid even look like? No one even knows. Exactly. Who's <laughs> the father? Don't even know. <laughs> it's such a good analogy. Oh, so good. <laughs> You're gonna have to tell me your question again because I don't even remember it. I'm just excited that I'm pregnant. I mean, <laughs> that's fantastic. Oh, that's so good. You were talking. About- See you knowing and staying with your questions, like staying, you know. Yes. Um, I guess it goes into like <laughs> something else that you've spoken on a little bit, which is like it's the bigness and everything we've talked about, but also like taking up space. You know, one of the questions I wrote down to ask you, and I was gonna word this a little better, but I'm just gonna read it as is. <laughs> How do we grow wild women out of Christianity? Oh, <laughs> <laughs> You sure you want me to answer that? I, I, do. I really want you to answer I it. I, I I think she's going to say something, Moose, that is going to blow your mind. I know. I can't wait. <laughs> How do we grow wild women? Wow. Um, first of all, I think that from the time of infancy, this messaging that you are broken and you, your heart is not to be trusted and that you are full of sin and separate from God is the biggest load of oppressive bullshit that we could eat and that we could teach our children. Like I remember being in um, a congregation one time of a place that I was speaking and the, and the pastor said, if you ever doubt that you're born into sin, just look at an infant who's screaming all the time, saying what, saying what she needs. Hmm. And in that moment, I'm like, wait, hold, wait, hold on. The fact that she needs milk, the fact that she's cold, Mm-hmm. The fact that her muscles are aching because she was just pushed out of a vagina, like now that means that she is full of sin because she is simply human. Mm-hmm. Like, no. And so for me, there was a very, very real moment in the glow of a lava lamp with my daughters, putting them to bed, where I just said to myself internally, you will know my God. Mm-hmm. You will know my God. And wow. that is my mission. My mission is for you to know who my God is. And my God is not sitting over here with a thumb. Yeah. And for you waiting to press you down, waiting to confine you and get you back into line. My God made you like gave you the imprint of God's own person within you. How powerful could you be? And the only thing that I see that is oppressive in any way 
are these messages from, you know, from organizations and institutions that require the oppressiveness of other people in order to just remain existent. Mm -hmm. Right. So how do we create wild women? I mean, I think it starts, I think it starts with our babies. I think it starts with like looking at them in the eye and saying, no, you trust yourself. Mm -hmm. Trust yourself. Trust what you know to be true. Speak your mind here. If you're not ready to forgive, that's okay. (laughs) You Mm -hmm. know, it's a space for humanity. Um, And then, you know, I think as well, picking up a book. (laughs) <laughs> there are so many women that have gone before us, women and men, who have been champions of this. Like we're not alone. We only feel alone because we haven't tapped into the resources. But there are resources there that will make you feel like you're not crazy, you know. And yes, and that will help just liberate you. And I think the other thing that we can do is exactly what we are doing right here: is sharing our stories. Yes. You know? Share our stories with boldness. And I didn't have the words or the tools in my own transformation to be able to say, hey, this is going on in, inside of me. So one thing that I encourage to w- women all the time is when you know that you are pregnant now and like this kid's going to come out and you don't know <laughs> what it's going to look like. <laughs> There's a spiritual rebirth happening within you. Mm-hmm. Be brave enough to say it. Be brave yeah. enough to speak it out loud. You know, it doesn't have to be elaborate and it doesn't have to Mm -hmm. cross any boundaries for you, but you can just simply say, I'm, I'm in a, I'm in a spiritual transformation right now. And Mm -hmm. I don't really want to talk about that. Yeah. And it's like, it makes me think to continue on with your analogy. It makes me think how incredibly important from a physiological standpoint alone, but if you broaden it out even further, how important a gestation period is. You know, there, there are things that go on in the weeks or however long it is of, of being pregnant and getting ready to give birth to a child. Like there are very necessary things that happen. And those are things that happen in a place of protection and covering and nurturing and feeding. And like, that's really, really important. I think so there's something about what we're talking about here that, that also points me toward how important that, that gestation time is for us. Not just if we're physically pregnant, having a baby, like apparently moose is, but the, the gestation period that we are in as we are evolving uh, spiritually, emotionally, personally. And, um, you talk about picking up a book. I love your advocacy of reading. It makes me so happy. And I know that in addition to the read with Jules book club, I know that you've made recommendations of everybody from Richard Rohr to Nadia Bolz Weber to, to Rachel Held Evans. What are some of the books that you're reading right now that are really making an impact on you? Mm. Um, <clears throat> Women Who Run With the Wolves. Yes. Mm-hmm. Oh, I have that on my shelf and I need to reread it. Yes, you can see my you can see my stack. I'm I'm usually working through a few at the same time. Um, <laughs> one that I so highly recommend, probably one of the top five books I've read in the last couple of years, is called Figuring by Mariah Popova. Mm. And um it's not necessarily, it's not at all about spirituality actually, but it is about love and how, mm. how many different facets and ways there are to love in a mm. life. And mm. it's also about the, the way that our stories interconnect with one another and how we feed and empower off of one another. Mm. Um, the other book is The American Transcendentalist, which is a, con- a collection of essays from you know, the, the thinkers that I mentioned before, the Margaret Fuller's, Walt Whitman, um, Ralph Aldo Emerson, Merton, um, yes. I highly recommend that as well. But, you know, I, I feel such, um, freedom now to, to allow myself to absorb what fits for me mm-hmm. and then just to go Meh, to the other parts that don't, mm-hmm. because I think really at the foundation of, of reading and discovery and knowledge, the things that do find their way woven into your soul are the things that make you the unique Im- imprint of God that you are. Yeah, for for sure. And I realized that 
um, I asked that question. I had this beautiful runway for us to talk about the book that you wrote. And then I didn't ask the damn question about the book. I, <laughs> I was like, Hey, what do you recommend? Kat, we already talked about that at the front of this podcast. There's a book club, please go join it. So what I would love to know is you've mentioned all of these amazing authors and books that you recommend. You yourself are an amazing author and have written a book and your book. I love the title of it. It's called pull it off removing your fears and putting on confidence. Can you tell us about your book? Oh, yes. This book, this is the first book that I wrote. And I sat my little ass down for five hours a day, every single day for eight months. Wow. It was like the child of that time. And honestly, you know, when the publisher approached me about writing the book, it was largely in in part because of the way that I dress because my work in fashion and, you know, self-expression. And so that's so much of what this book is about. It's so much about um, peer pressure and how we succumb to it. It's about insecurity, where it comes from in the brain and how we actually cannot be courageous without recognizing our insecurity first. So this whole messaging out there in the world, like right now, of like be fearless, like, I'm, you know, I'm totally fearless. It's complete bullshit. Like, unless you're a sociopath, like, <laughs> yeah, exactly. I don't want to read your book, but you know, um, like this, this idea of fearlessness is basically another idea of like the perfect woman, you know, it just doesn't even exist or like the perfect body who, who even knows, you know? And so if we can like get cozy with our fear and with our insecurities, if we can be brave enough to see ourselves in the dark parts of ourselves, um, that's actually where courage has the opportunity to exercise itself. So good. What do you what do you want people to encounter when they experience you, whether that's in a book club or just in your writings? Like what I always ask that to artists. And I'm just curious your answer. Like, what do you want people to walk away with? Mm, I love that question, too. <sighs> I want them to walk away not knowing that they're not alone. And then the thing that inspires me the most is to learn something new or to mm -hmm. grow in a certain way or to have my eyes opened in a, to a different perspective, to grow in our empathy, which ultimately grows our understanding and grows our knowledge and grows our love. So that's what I want. You know, I want people, if it's them coming up to me in person and sharing their story or sharing their story on direct message or um, opening up on the book club or coming, God willing, in the future to a show, if we can ever have those again. <laughs> um, you know, I want, I want you to feel seen. I want you to feel not alone. And then I want you to walk away feeling like I can. Yeah. Hmm. I, I would like to say, Juliana Zobrist, that in my experience of you in just this interview, mission accomplished, I feel like I have learned so much. I have felt like I'm not alone and I have felt also really empowered and, and, and like, I have a bit of a, a of a willingness to be vulnerable with where I'm at in my process. And so I just want to say like from the person I know it's not literal and it's virtual right now, but the person sitting right across from you, well done mission accomplished. Thank you. So good. Um, I, I also want to add on to that, like me being an eight, you know, like I remember kind of seeing your transformation, which is so hard to say to, you know, someone you don't know. Like I actually said that to someone one time, like five years ago, I sent a, a friend, it was an acquaintance of mine. I kind of was just watching them on Facebook and, and the things they were sharing and things like that. I just felt like a kinship, you know? And I said that to them. I said, oh my gosh, I feel like we're on the same path. And the note I got back was, you have no idea what path I'm on. So I'm very careful. <laughs> I'm very careful to say that. But um, I do feel that as well. Like when I remember like at the beginning being like, oh shit, you know what I mean? Cause like I had, I had known of you prior to this transformation as well. And it went from, oh shit to, oh my God, I need I need to stick around and see what she's sharing because it, it was so inspiring and it felt so true to, um, my journey as well. 
Um, and I did reach out to um, one of our listeners that's like a core listener. And I just said, I asked if they knew who you were. And I said, do you have anything you want to ask? Um, and it was a guy, actually, but um, he was absolutely aware of you. And, and he said, um, what would you say to people who are experiencing doubt or fear? They might be heading into, you know, a spiritual deconstruction. How would you encourage them to not give up on that journey when it, when, you know, you have so many people around you who are kind of in the Christian bubble? Hmm. First of all, I love that you asked somebody and I do appreciate that it was a man that's, you know, willing to step forward and say that this too is, this is difficult for anyone. It's not just, yes. um, well, I would say first and foremost, kind of what I said before, which is to be honest, you know, if this man is, has a partner, um, to be honest about that, to not be afraid, just sort of step back a little bit, like allow yourself space. As you were saying, Kat, you were saying, um, gestation period, you were using that terminology. And and I immediately thought, yes, the darkness, like everything Mm, beautiful comes out of the dark. That's right. Not only babies, but like we have to experience winter in order to spring. There is an ebb in the flow. There is darkness to light. Like if we have the eyes to see it, nature is just this resounding, (laughs) this resounding message of it's okay to die. It's okay to die even while you are still alive. Yeah. It's a very real thing. Mm -hmm. And so um, I would tell him that you are not alone and that. There are people, um, it's, it's difficult to talk about because it is such a personal journey, um, that no one's going to give you like the, ta-da, this is how you just come out of it, you know? And I, and I, I know that this metaphor has been used a lot, but like, um, Sue Monk Kidd talks about this in a couple of her books, one in particular called When the Heart Waits. She talks about, um, the chrysalis of the caterpillar to the butterfly and how Mm -hmm. some caterpillars can actually like make themselves not go into their chrysalis yet. Like (laughs) there is an act of submission that goes into allowing itself to enter into this stage of transformation. And just be patient with yourself, you know, be very gentle on yourself. Um, Protect yourself is another thing that I would say from people who are going to come at you with the shame and come at you with the Bible and come at you with all of the things that are going to make you want to just run in the opposite direction, you know? Yeah. And I say gentle because I'll tell a personal story of my own just briefly, but, um, it is painful, you know, and, and people, there's a grieving that happens when you're leaving the really nice, finely constructed, safe boundaries of an organized religion. There's a grieving that takes place because everything out there is unknown. Like in here feels safe. It feels confining and it feels not true. And it feels inauthentic to me now, but at least I know what's expected of me. But that feels terrifying. And that feels like the wilderness. And I was in, um, I was in a therapy session and you guys, I came out of my therapy session with a, it was a Christian situation and I pounded my fist into the granite countertop, Mm. like angry with myself, Mm. angry with myself, like stop changing. Why are you changing? Like if you could just, it's that moment in labor as women where you're like, can we put the kid back in? This is too (laughs) much. You know, you will reach that point where it is, it feels just, insurmountable. The pain feels insurmountable. The, it feels like it costs too much. It feels like it's not worth it. But what I have to say to him and to anyone who's listening to this is that the fullness of God, the expansive, broad, never ending, unassailable love of God is on the other side. Mm-hmm. And it's unbelievable what happens when you allow everything that's superfluous to to fall away, you're left. And it might be just a mustard seed, but it's like the white hot center of a fire mustard seed. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) I love it. It burns. (laughs) It is so good. So that's what I would say. Beautiful. That is so awesome. For everybody listening, we just want to remind you that you are listening to the Cat and Moose podcast and we 
have had the lovely opportunity of interviewing Juliana Zobrist, who now, because we're friends now, we call her Jules. (laughs) (laughs) I just have one more question for you. um, And then I want to read something else of yours. Um, You kind of, you kind of touched on this with what you just shared, but I'm just curious. This is a question uh, I want to always ask our guests. How has your view on God changed through all of this? God is everywhere. And I can find the face of God in every single person, not Mm. just the ones that I thought I could find it in. Mm. Yeah. All right. Uh, I want to read this and just have you share any more. This is something um, that you posted that really, really touched me. And honestly, I just want to say, you know, I I think that, um, not to just over flatter here, but it's very meaningful for me. Um, I feel like the way you speak is, um, the way I feel like Jesus speaks to me when I, when I hear his voice, when I hear God, you know, like, I feel like it's so affirming and, Mm. uh, and I think we need more of that in this space. Um, So here's something you share. Just in case you were thinking of becoming one today, let me remind you, Jesus was not a pleaser. He was a compassionate, subversive truth teller and advocate. To the shock of his parents and the dismay of the religious, do not keep the peace if it means sacrificing your own. Take up space today. I love you. So good. Thank you. I mean, taking up space, that, that is what Jesus did, you know? He took up space, I think, in all of the right places. And Mm -hmm. he was an advocate. Mm -hmm. He was an advocate. And the only people that he pissed off were the righteous and the religious, (laughs) you know? And they're constantly trying to tee him up. My my favorite story is the woman who was caught in adultery Mm -hmm. that the religious pull out, Mm -hmm. you know? Because according to scripture, she should be stoned. So, Mm -hmm. well, the Bible says people that you're referring to this, um, a a lot of times I see those people as those people. Well, the Bible says, you know, the scriptures say, yeah. and Jesus saw the world. And from my perspective, he saw the world through the eyes of love, through the eyes of relentless grace Mm -hmm. and extravagant grace and offensive grace, you know? Grace is offensive, and he was the first one to teach us that. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Damn, I feel like I am just been on Oprah's soul story. So- is that what it's called? Soul story? <laughs> <laughs> Super Soul Sunday. That's what it is. <laughs> Oprah in my life. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> Awesome. Thank you. Well, we, we will continue to be really strong advocates and, um, and supporters of you and what you do and, and the message that you share, because it's, it's really, um, it's, I think it's really powerful and really important and, and people need to hear it. And thank you for using your voice. Like, thank you so much for your bravery and thank you so much for, the pain and the hiding in the solitude and, and, and being in the dark places that are necessary to, to do and say what you're doing. Like, thank you for that because it really, it really is important, not only for you, but I think the people hearing your voice and it, it is, it is really, um, really made a a lasting and I think permanent for sure impression on my heart. So thank you for that. Mm -hmm. Thank you all very, very much. It really was a joy to connect with you. And I love that you're in Nashville. I need friends in Nashville. So I know you're joking about being my friend, but I actually would like to be your no, friend. No, yeah. <laughs> we are not joking. We also need friends yeah, for what it's like. Really here, so. <laughs> I feel very stuck. <laughs> Yeah, we I feel like we have a great community of people here that all kind of, you know, sing harmony to this song, (laughs) you know. So, um, yeah, we welcome you. Absolutely. It it would be lovely to stay connected with you. And um, yeah, that's really exciting to me. Thank you so much for your time, Juliana. We appreciate it so much. You're so welcome. Anytime. Thank you. Oh, my God. producer Sarah Reed. To find out more, go to catandmoosepodcast.com. Cat and Moose is a 
BP Production. 